Krish, welcome so much to Facing the Canon. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. Well, absolutely thrilled. Well, Krish, what's that short for? It's short for Krishna, because no. my father, Yes. Uh, well, he was born in Malaysia, but his father is Sri Lankan, and a Sri Lankan Hindu Tamil family. Right, and where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in exotic Brighton. Did you? <laughs> yeah. I, my ancestry is slightly confusing. So my dad's Malaysian but Sri Lankan. My mum was born in India, but her dad was Irish. Right. So, you know, when the Olympics are on, it gets really confusing about yeah. who to cheer for. My wife's half English and half Welsh, yeah. and uh, our kids are from all sorts of different places. About, oh. <laughs> uh, so, growing up, what kind of um, faith was your family? Kind of mixed. So, I mean, my, my parents were amazing people and they gave me real freedom of religion. They said, we're not going to induct you into Hinduism and force you to be a Hindu. We're also not going to force you to be a Catholic Christian like my mum. And so I was allowed to choose for myself. And when I was eight years old, the coolest bit of outreach uh, that was culturally relevant happened. And uh, I felt the kind of earth moving. And there was this massive thud, 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 thud coming up and out, up and down our hill. It was the Salvation Army band. <laughs> and uh, when you're eight years old, that is the coolest thing you've ever seen. Yeah. And uh, so I just asked my mum if I could go wherever they were going. And so she very dutifully took me along to the Salvation Army. And I was in the Sunday school there. I, I looked around one morning. I, I was definitely the brownest boy <laughs> in that room. And the only one that wasn't related to someone in the Salvation Army. But I had such lovely Sunday school teachers. I was the one always asking the questions and how about this and what about that? And uh, one morning... So obviously you didn't have a God f understanding. I had a mixture of understandings, you know. So my, my dad was a, a kind of nominal Hindu, so he, you know, he ate beef and wore leather jackets but went to the temple every now and again. And my mum was kind of a, a bit open in her understanding of her faith. And so the Salvation Army was the first time that the bits of the, the Christian message began to make sense for me. But then when did it crystallise more for you to become personal? Um, I went up to secondary school and I went to a really tough all boys comprehensive school. I mean, it's the kind of place where when the teacher was outside of the room, our, our chemistry lab was our form room. And so the kids would suck the gas out of the gas taps and try to light it on their breath. And it was a dangerous place to be. I mean, what, what one morning there was this lad, Nicky Leonard, and he has, had his cheeks full of gas. And um, don't try this at home, children. No. But uh, I, I challenged him to put a lighted match in his ear to see what would happen. But <laughs> yeah. anyway, dangerous place. And then one day, uh, I was about 15 years old, and, and a lad stood up. The teacher had nipped outside for a quick smoke, leaving a 15-year-old boy in charge of the classroom. And this lad said, boys, you've, you've got to know something. Something amazing happened to me last night. Last night, I became a friend of God, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I thought, that is the bravest thing I've ever seen anyone do. You know, I, I'd been secretly going to church, but hadn't told a soul about it. But here was someone going live with their faith, as it were. And I went straight up to him. I said, what are you doing? You know, we, we Christians, we don't talk about this thing. It's all very private. And he said to me, Chris, if you knew the God that I met last night, you wouldn't be able to be quiet about it. Wow. And that really challenged me. And through him, I came into a kind of living personal friendship with Jesus. Wow. I mean, that, that is quite significant for, for a 15-year-old. It was. I and mean, we became mates, you know, we divided the class into two. He took all the kids whose surnames were A to L and I took M to Z and we were systematically going to help them understand more about the Christian faith. And uh, we weren't very good at it, <laughs> but we were trying. But you had a go. We had a go, yeah. And then, obviously, that kind of set you up and you then went off to university. Yeah, I, I was struggling to know um, what to study at university. I, I wanted to do uh, RE or philosophy or Russian or something that I thought would be useful because I had this plan that I was going to be a cross-cultural missionary. Yes. And uh, I was going to go undercover into the Soviet Union and by day maybe I'd be a scientist or something and by night I could be an evangelist. Yes. That was the plan. And uh, so I kind of chose a chemistry degree. I thought that would be a good way in. And I was really happy, but... I was also a little bit disappointed that halfway during my A-levels, the Berlin Wall came down. And so my chemistry degree wasn't really that necessary to be able to do what I wanted to do. Yeah. <laughs> but I was rejoicing that it was, yeah. it was good for, you know, freedom of conscience and liberty. And is that where you met your wife? 
Uh, yeah, we met, we met each other the first week of university, but it took us two years to get round to dating. Yes, but then when did you get married? Uh, we got married as soon as possible. As soon as she left uh, uni, uh, we got married like the day after her graduation, I think it was. And then the, the two of you went off to Albania. Yeah, we worked for a little while with the university students. Um, university students are at an amazing time in their lives where they're often open to new ideas, uh, willing to think through the big issues of life and full of brilliant questions that I find really exciting. And they also have a lot of time on their hands, which they don't necessarily realise. And so we worked for university, with the university students in the UK and then we took a team and worked with the newly opened up country of Albania. And uh, there was such a, a receptivity. Which had been the only atheistic Europeans yeah, it was, at one time. it was one of the most atheistic countries in the world. Yes. Uh, religion of all sorts was banned. Uh, you couldn't name your son John because that was a religious name and sometimes you weren't even allowed to have facial hair because that was seen to be you know, a religious symbol. So it was an incredibly secular place. And then it all opened up and everybody kind of came in and kind of started to, I suppose, explain the gospel and the good news and there was an incredible receptivity. It was a real privilege to be part of that time in the country. But you then went back and studied more. I did. So what, what prompted you to go back to further study? Well, Albania was an incredible experience, but it, it was a little bit frustrating in that we managed to export into a country that had no formal church structures every kind of division you could imagine. Uh, there were 11 Baptist churches in the capital city and it wasn't even a big city. You know, there was the First Baptist and then there was the Free Baptist who broke away from the First Baptist and then there was the, the Free and the <coughs> Spirit Baptist who broke away from the Free Baptist and then there was the, the Word and Spirit Baptist who thought the Spirit people didn't do the Bible well. Yes. And I, I was kind of really sad that we had taken such an opportunity to bring unity to the Gospel yes. and the Church and we just exported every kind of division you can imagine. Yeah. And so I thought, look, there's got to be a better way of doing this. So I, I really wanted to study theology and particularly how it relates to mission to say, well, you know, we could do a better job. Because sometimes uh, out of, I suppose, good intentions and good motives, uh, sometimes we're not often as thoughtful as we ought to be in no. how we do things. So, so where did you go and study? So I studied part time in Birmingham yeah. at uh, the School of Mission there. And when I finished my master's, I did a PhD at King's College in London. And what did you do your doctorate in? So I, I, in my master's, I came across this incredible um, missionary called Leslie Newbegin. Yes. And uh, he was incredible. Who you know, I, so I met. Did you? I've and in fact, he and I were speakers at no the same way. conference. Oh, I'm oh my jealous. Word. Can you I'm jealous. Yeah, but can you imagine me having to speak in front of him? <laughs> <laughs> he was an incredibly gracious guy. Yeah. And the thing I loved about him was that, you know, he retired from being the Bishop of Madras. And then his wife and him decided to travel back from India by bus, just so they could kind of re-entry gently. And when they came back, they realised that there was as much of a need for mission and evangelism here in the Western world. And he kind of started a whole movement that some people call the missional church movement. Yep. And it was all about what does the gospel need to say to Western culture, not just other countries and overseas. And, you know, some of his best work uh, was written in his 70s. And I think that's just really encouraging for people like me to think that we've got a lifetime ahead of us of studying God's word and making it known. So was your doctorate focused on his, his teaching? Yeah, I was really interested in how he understood a theology of evangelism. Yeah. And um, evangelism has become, uh, I suppose, a difficult thing for the church to think about. It's become politically incorrect, as it were. And he really grounded his understanding of what the gospel was and how we share it in a really big theological framework. And I really like that. Yeah. Now, you've done various things since then, um, but the two things that you do now, one is at the London School of Theology, and you're the president of London School of Theology. I am, which is a really exciting title. I think they just <laughs> made it up for me. Yes. And um, I was hoping it would include an aeroplane, but apparently <laughs> yes. I'm not that kind of president. Yeah. But no, it's a privilege. I get to go around and, and tell people the, the, the power and the joy of studying theology. Uh, so most of my teaching for the college is done outside of the college, at churches and conferences, yes. and through writing and speaking. And uh, I, I get the privilege of spending some time with the students uh, through chapel services and, yes. and you know, that, that kind of place. T tell us a bit about London School of Theology. 
Well, officially, we are yes. the largest interdenominational <laughs> theological college in Europe. Yes. And uh, if you think about some of the people that graduated from us, they've actually shaped a lot of the, the 20th century's uh, evangelical structures. I think it's the last five directors of the Evangelical Alliance have all been graduates from yeah. LST. Uh, people like Terry Virgo, who founded the New Frontiers Network, yeah. graduate from LST. Um, you know, the current head of the Vineyard Network, graduate from London School of Theology. Yeah. So we really have helped train up some of the key leaders in this nation, and not just in the church. We've sent them into all sorts of spheres of life, whether that's politics or broadcasting or teaching. And uh, normally, whenever I'm around preaching somewhere, I'll bump into someone that has been blessed by the ministry of LST. Uh, do, you, do you know how many people have actually graduated over the oh, years? Oh, man, I should know that. It's thousands, isn't it? It probably is, yes. Now. And um, it's also quality, not just quantity. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, that's really... <laughs> so that's one of the things that you do. And the other thing that you do is that uh, you're a director of a charity called Home for Good. Yes. And what does that do? So Home for Good has a really simple job. It wants to find a home for every child in the UK that needs one. And sadly, there are thousands of children in the care system uh, that need um, adequate and um, loving foster families and long-term adoptive families. And so we founded that charity two years ago and uh, we're just so excited by the response that we're seeing across the UK church. G Chris, could you um, kind of introduce us to some facts mm. uh, and statistics so that we, we can get our head round who, how many people are we talking about, what's, <coughs> the, what's the situation? So every 20 minutes in the UK, a child gets taken into care and um, that child probably comes into care at school. So imagine that a child, this happened to one of our uh, foster children, they were taken out of their class into the head teacher's office and told, look, you're not going to be able to go home at the end of today. Oh, well, why not? Well, we, we can't get into the details of that, but you can't go home today. Uh, OK, well, can I at least say goodbye to my mum and dad? No, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not possible for you to say goodbye to mum and dad. How about my sister? Can I say goodbye to my sister? No. How about the family dog? No, I'm really sorry, you can't. Well, where am I going to go? Well, you're going to go with this lady. She's called a social worker. Well, where's she going to take me? Well, she's going to take you to a foster family. Who are they? Well, I, I don't know their names, but they're a nice family that are going to look after you. And so this lad turns up in our house and he's got his lunchbox and his swimming kit and that's all he has. And so there needs to be more families able to offer a child like that who's had the trauma of that removal. There needs to be more families to wrap around them. And currently in the UK, we're 8,600 families short. On top of that, um, most of the time, the children that get removed from their families and taken into the care system, most of them never go home again. Um, so with this little lad that I was telling you about, it was really sad that um, it, the closest he got to going home was to go and look up his house on Google Maps yeah. and zoom in on it. And uh, we kind of didn't have the heart to tell him that actually his family had moved since. And so he was zooming in on a house that his family weren't in. These children don't get to go home. and if if they stay in the care system, the statistics of what happens to them when they leave care, when they age out of care at 18, are pretty terrible. Um, I think it's around 25% of the prison population in the UK are young men that have aged out of care. It's a huge percentage of the homeless population are young men that have aged out of care. In some areas it's 30%, in other areas it's 70% of sex workers are young women that have aged out of care and they just had no one around them to love them and care for them. So we want to help find these children adoptive homes, people that will love them forever, not just until they're 18, but until their dying day. You know, I, I, my mum died when I was 40 years old, but I miss her still. Yeah. And so, you know, you don't just need a parent until you're a teenager or an 18 year old, you need it for life. And that's what adoption gives. And currently in the UK, there's around 4,000 children waiting for adoption. Now you put those stats together and that's a lot of families that we need. <coughs> And the government's really struggling to think, well, where can we find those families? But I did some maths and I worked out of churches like the one we're in today, in the UK, there's about 15,000. Yes. So you know what? I don't need every Christian to adopt 100 children. I just need each church in the UK to find a new foster family or a new adoptive family for the church to wrap around them. And we've met the entire need. So it's really doable. That would change the lives of children. It would change the lives of the church. It would begin to offer God the kind of worship that he wants. And can you imagine what that says to the nation about our God? 
that our God is a protector of widows and orphans and his people are going to walk in his footsteps. So we think this is a tremendous opportunity to show grace and kindness, but actually to be a living parable of the gospel. You said every 20 minutes um, a child is removed from their family. Um, and are you able to comment on the reasons most of these children are removed? Why? Yeah, sadly, it's around 70% of the children are removed because of neglect or abuse. And, you know, so that is incredibly traumatic that these children haven't been looked after in the way they should have been. And, you know, sometimes it's families that have got all sorts of challenges around addiction issues or mental health issues. And, and you know, we, we don't want to be judgmental about why these children have been removed. Our job is just to make sure they get the loving homes sure. that they need. So many of these children are actually quite traumatised. Yeah, all the children that come into care are traumatised, even if they've come because of, you know, perfectly innocent reasons. The, just the removal into a new family, a strange family that you don't know, that's incredibly traumatic. Now, you, you said, how, uh, just to say the statistic again, how many children are currently in need of fostering? So, um, every child in the UK has a foster family. OK, so no, nobody's being put in the wrong place at the moment. But the problem is that often they're not appropriate. So, for example, um, this little boy that we talked about, he, he, if he had a sister, um, often there aren't enough carers to be able to look after both of them. They just don't have the capacity. So these children are separated. Um, or uh, to help the child have a bit of continuity in their lives, um, we try to keep them in the same school. But if there are no foster carers near, I've heard of children that are being commuting an hour each way to go to their school on their own with a taxi driver. So um, there are inadequate um, coverage, as it were, uh, for, for um, foster families. But, but many are, how many children are we talking about? All together in the UK, there are 62,000 children in care. Right, and many of those are looking for more permanent homes. Exactly right. So they're in, many of them are in temporary homes, yeah. <coughs> looking, waiting, for um, someone to take them in in order to foster them long term or to adopt them? Exactly, both. Both. And, and we think both are brilliant and uh, fostering long term is the right solution for some children so they can stay in touch with their brothers and sisters, aunties and uncles and, and grandparents. But for a lot of children, adoption is the best solution because they're going to have a family forever. And how many um, people give up their babies when they're born? Very few people um, relinquish their children on their own um, choice. Most children that come into care are removed because the parent is not able to care for them. But there are, are the age range of children, is it from naught up though? It is, and the challenging piece though is that when it comes to adoption, um, most adopters really want a baby. Yes. And that's totally understandable. Babies are amazing. You know, I, I love babies to bits. But the challenge is that um, older children, so three, four, five, six, seven year olds, because they're not babies, they're often seen to be not wanted. And so they wait and they wait. And um, particularly if they've got a brother or sister, you know, can you imagine that, you know, the younger one gets adopted and the older one gets left behind? That's got to be tough. Um, particularly if they come from black or minority ethnic backgrounds. And especially if they've got any kind of physical or uh, emotional disabilities, they often get left behind. And so our call to the church is to say, look, it's essential to our understanding of the Christian faith that God didn't just forgive us, he didn't just rescue us, he didn't just release us uh, from slavery, God adopted us and decided yes. he's gonna be our dad forever. And when God adopted us, he didn't adopt us because um, he needed it. God wasn't lonely. We believe in God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, a perfect community, a perfect family. God didn't adopt us because he needed it. God adopted us because we needed it. And so we're asking people to show the same compassion that God showed to us. So instead of seeing if these children measure up to some kind of list, you know, I want a little one, or I want a girl, or I want a one with no physical defects, or, you know, I want, I want a, a young one. Imagine God had had that kind of list with you and me, that before he was willing to adopt <coughs> us into his family, we needed to be physically perfect or young or no emotional baggage. Now God saw us in our need and he said, I'll take you as you are and I'll love you whatever. 
And we're asking the church to show that kind of adopting love to the children that are waiting. Okay, Chris, help us to understand though, this is complex, very sensitive. You know, you might have a, a, a couple, uh, they've got two children, okay? By taking in another child as a foster child, will it affect the relationship with the other children? How will the other children react to another child coming in? Explain those complexities. Those are really good questions. And like I said, this isn't for everybody. We, we don't actually need every Christian to adopt or foster. And so, you know, we all got to look at our own circumstances, weigh up our own family situation and work out what's best. It does affect your whole family, fostering um, and adopting. But I would like to say that it can affect it in a really positive way. So we, we had, my wife and I, three children, uh, birth children, and uh, they were uh, aged three, two and one. You know, we had three and three years. We were under 30. It was all very yes. exciting. And um, I, I guess I was... I was thinking that's that's good three and three years it means that uh, at that sad day when my children uh, leave home it's possible they're all going to leave home together yes and uh, there may be a silver lining to that yes. in that our empty nest could become a love nest again just yes. just me and the wife long yes. romantic walks along beaches we live in oxford which is about as far away as you can get from a beach yes but anyway we had a great plan and then and my wife says to me well why don't we become foster parents and i said that's a great idea for other people that's so going to spoil all my plans you know no more walks on beaches we'll be back to nappies and stabilizers and parent teachers yeah. meetings and, and how old were your children when your wife suggested that Shit, they were four five and six okay four five and six so okay yep. so this curveball is thrown at you yeah and i'm going no i was pretty resistant and um, two things happened one was some friends of ours in their 60s became foster parents for the first time and that really challenged me because I thought, well, you know, if they could do that in their 60s, we've got some energy so, in our 30s. So their children had grown up and left? Left, yeah. And then they decided they'll be foster parents? That's right. All the okay. skills they had from raising their own kids, they thought this was another chance and they did a great job. And then just as I opened the Bible, verse after verse began to really challenge me. So one of them was James 1.27, you probably know it well. You know, true religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is to care for widows and orphans, orphans in their distress. And I'm going, you've got me, God. You know, I can't resist that. You could, couldn't have made that any clearer. I can't explain it away. I can't say, oh, it was different in the Old Testament. You know, it's, it's all there. Yeah. So I'm in. And I guess I was worried, would this affect my children negatively? Yes. You know, um, and, and, and a lot of people gave us some advice. You know, you, you don't want these problem children coming into your house and messing up your kids. And I began to think that that doesn't sound like a very Christian way of approaching family life. You know, we have an expression in, in England, don't we? That we say an, English, an Englishman's home is his castle. Yes. And I get that, you know, you, you can be nice to people out there in the world. You can, you know, go out and volunteer as long as you come back and your home is all safe. And I thought, well, that, a Christian approach to your home is very different. A Christian's home is supposed to be a hospital. It's where the word hospitality comes yes, from, isn't it? You welcome right. you the broken, the yes. needy into your home. Thought, okay, that, that's a good point. And then the other thing that began to happen is as we began to look after um, these children that have had all sorts of tough things happen to them, I watched some wonderful things come out in the character of my older kids. I'll tell you a couple of stories. One, yes. one was um, this huge lad turned up at our door once and he had a pink pull-along suitcase and his social worker was kind of saying her goodbyes and, and, and off she went and then there he was kind of taking up the whole door frame. And so we kind of welcome him in and we sit him down and um, he's got a massive gash on the side of his face. And it turned out that his own mother had attacked him. I thought she'd used a knife but she'd actually used her fingernails on his face. And his arm was all bandaged up because she'd poured boiling water on him too. And he'd come straight from hospital to our house. So he was all shell-shocked. How old? About 13. 13, OK. And, um, you know, I try to make small talk. I'm quite good at that, but I'm getting yeah. nothing. Yeah. And, um, you know, football, nothing. And then my two older boys, they, they introduced a therapeutic intervention that I wasn't aware of. It was called an Xbox 360. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, look, come on, yeah. let's have a game. Have a yeah. game of FIFA. 
Now, my son, I, I did something wrong in his, his, his raising as a child. He's an Arsenal supporter. Yes. And, um, and, and you're a Liverpool supporter. I am. Yeah. That's and right. And I'm an Arsenal supporter. Well, we love you. That's right. <laughs> right. So this, this lad that was coming to stay with us, he was an Arsenal supporter. And my boy says, OK, I'll tell you what, you be Arsenal and me and, me and my brother will be Man United. Yeah. And somehow, Arsenal won that game 5-0. Yes. And I'm, I'm kind of in the kitchen listening in. And I'm hearing things like, great shot, mate. Well done. How did you get past my keeper? And I'm, I'm hearing these words of encouragement coming from my teenage boys. I'm, I've never been prouder. I just <laughs> yeah. thought, they're just doing the right stuff. And, you know, it, he, he, he settled in. He began to relax. His shoulders unhunched. And we, we went out for a walk that night because um, he hadn't got a toothbrush with him. And so we went down to Sainsbury's mm. and... Um, I was like the father hen, and you got all these chicks behind me, the three boys are following me down the aisles and we're going up and down, up and I couldn't find toothbrushes anywhere. And this boy says, you don't come here very often, do you, Chris? And I think, that's brilliant, he's cracking a joke. Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah. You know, three hours ago, he wouldn't even look at me in the eye, but now, because of my, the way my boys have looked after him, yeah. he's relaxing. So, you know, you... As a parent, I want to do the best I can for my kids. Of you know, course. we've moved to an area where there's a good school, they're into sport, one of them wants to learn a musical instrument. We'll wrap around them, those things. But as a Christian parent, I have a responsibility to not only help them flourish in education and physical health, but actually to grow like Jesus. Sure. So how can I help my kids become gracious and gentle and compassionate, just like Jesus? How long did he stay with you? He stayed about nine months. Nice. And then he got into a long-term foster family. Are you still in touch? Well, yeah, it was really sweet. We got a phone call from his school at the end of term and they'd done a kind of highlights of the year piece. And uh, he, he'd, he'd written down, I mean, it had been a terrible year because of all that had happened to him. But he'd said one of the highlights of his year was coming to stay with the Kandaya. So I thought, yes, we made an impact. Is it, is it painful after nine months saying goodbye? It is. And one little girl we looked after from birth until she was three and a half. And... Some people say to me, Chris, oh, I could never do what you do, Chris. I'd love these kids too much to give them up. And I try to remain composed because it sounds like you're saying, well, you'd love them more than I would. And I, I kind of try not to respond by saying, wait, wait, wait. You're going to love this child so much that because you're worried about getting hurt, you're not going to get involved in their lives at all. Yeah. That isn't love. That's self-protection. It is an occupational hazard of a foster parent that your heart gets broken on a regular basis. But that's our job, isn't it? We take the pain so these children get the help and love that they need. So that, um, that particular child, uh, boy or girl? Boy. Boy, arrived as a baby. Oh, sorry, that was a girl. Yeah. That was a girl, as yes. a baby. As a baby. But, and you knew that one day a family may come... And it took and them three and a half years. It took three and a half... Did you not want to adopt? We did. We, we did, but it wasn't, it wasn't possible. So, yeah, we don't often get the choice whether we get to adopt or not. That's someone else's choice. So it was really hard. And that particular one was really difficult because after three and a half years, we must have given them 2,000 photos on a photo disc of this child. She'd been on every family holiday. She'd been at every birthday party, every Christmas. And the family wanted to have nothing to do with us at the end. And so I, I remember we, we posted her a, a birthday present and about a week later, it came back to us in the post and said, we meant no contact. So that was, that was doubly heartbreaking. But the, the social services wouldn't even consider you to adopt them? Sometimes it's more complicated because there's a family member that might come forward and so family okay. members have um, priority. And, you know, our choices are really difficult because we love all the kids that come through, um, but not everybody's cut out to be a foster parent. And so if we adopted them, then suddenly our house becomes full and we can't foster anymore. Yeah, of so course. You, you do what you can. So currently in your household, yes. who do you have? So we ha I have one wife. <laughs> <laughs> one wife. Three birth children. Yes. And How old are your birth children uh, now? 17, 16 and 15. OK, and? Uh, an adopted daughter and two long-term foster children. OK, how did you, your adopted daughter, did she first come as a foster? She did. At, at what age? She came straight from hospital um, and... Oh, like day two, one, two? Yeah, straight, straight to us. OK. Mum was in a difficult place and so wasn't able to look after her. 
And so we, we took her in, everyone fell in love with her, our neighbours fell in love with her, they knitted her a quilt so that she would have a quilt that no one else in the world would have. Our church fell in love with her and they'd bring us meals every day at five o'clock. But on, I think it was day six of her life, they brought us round coronation chicken which sounded really nice, but have you ever seen what comes out of a six-day-old baby? <laughs> <laughs> Looks a lot yeah. like coronation yeah, chicken. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, if your church does this meal rotor thing, yeah, yeah, make yeah. sure There's they no give curry. some advice. It's the curry. It is, it's bad. But, but, but you didn't know whether the, um, what's her name? I can't really say oh, her okay. name. Oh, OK, that the, the, she would be taken away. We knew that she might be. And actually she was. Um, things got better with Mum again. And so she went to be with Mum. And then things didn't go so well with Mum, so she came back to oh, be with us. came back. And then went back again. And the last time social services said, this child has had so much trauma, the best thing that could happen to her is if you adopted her. Oh. And so we did. And she loves it. So was... she's one of yours now? Yeah, yeah. Right. But you've also got two foster children. We do, yeah. How old are they? Uh, I can't really say. Um, not because I can't. No, I understand. I don't know, okay, two children. Two children. And but you don't know how long you're going to keep them. No, we are going to look after them forever. So, long term. Yeah. Okay. So you're not somebody. So the point I'm trying to draw from you mm. here, Chris, is you're not somebody who's theoretical about this. You and your wife are practitioners. We are. Yeah. You actually live this. We do our best, and you know we're we're one of hundreds, if not thousands, of Christian families that are doing the same. I've got a little bit of profile because of what I do in of the rest course. of my life. But there is, you know, an unknown, unseen army of people that are doing this day in, day out. OK. I had a conversation the other day with a, a Christian couple, hmm. uh, can't have children, uh, want to adopt. And it sounded as though social services uh, were discriminating against them. Hmm. They were asking them questions like, uh, do you have friends who are not Christians? And, it, and I've had conversations with several Christian couples mm. who say that the process is so difficult. Yes. So why is it so difficult? And are, are social <coughs> services slightly discriminating Christians? OK, let, let me take that in two halves. So firstly, why is the process difficult? Yes. I want you to imagine that you've got children that are school age, let's say, and you know that for whatever reason you're not going to be able to look after them. Let, let's say you've got a terminal disease, you know, you know God forbid, but let's, let's imagine it. So you know you're going to die, and so you're wondering who's going to be able to look after your children. And some strangers come forward, and they're going to be the ones that look after your children. H how many questions would you ask them before you were willing to hand those children over? Ten questions? A hundred questions, a thousand questions. I'd want to think about every possible permutation of what could happen in this family's life before they were willing, or I was willing, to let my children be looked after by them. And the state has that responsibility for these children. Yes. And because, as I said, 70% of them have experienced neglect or abuse, we can't risk that they just be placed anywhere. We've got to make sure they're going to be a safe, secure family unit that's going to carry on looking after them. So everybody gets a rigorous set of assessments. I really respect social workers. I think they have one of the most difficult jobs in the world because when something bad happens, um, we, ask, we say, well, why didn't they ask more questions? Why didn't they dig a bit deeper? Why didn't they do their homework? But when we're on the receiving end of being assessed, you know what we say? Why are they being so nosy? Why are they asking so many questions? So they've got to get kicked both sides. So I think it is a really tough profession and I, I think more Christians should step up to do it actually. It's a really uh, wonderful way you can express the compassion of God is to be looking after the most vulnerable people in society. So the system, the process is rigorous for a reason. But on that, Chris, if I may add, yes, it is rigorous uh, and they ask many, many questions and they're talking about vulnerable children and there's a history of making wrong decisions, sure. putting vulnerable children in vulnerable situations. I know. So they, they still don't get it right. It's so hard, it's so difficult. You know, it, it's sometimes people look great on the surface um, and you know, y your neighbors don't know what's going on. So it, it's so hard. 
But on the second point about our Christian being... But you're, being, you're basically saying they're doing their best. They're doing their best. They're doing their best. Yeah, okay. it, and they get criticised heavily in the press and, you know, I'm sure there are some places where they're not doing as good as they should be and there are all sorts of problems. But in general, I've they're never different. met a social worker that wasn't not, trying hard. But, but do you think Christians are being discriminated? Um, in general, I would say no. You know, okay. we, 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 were, we were Christians when we went through the process, we went with our local authority, they were firm but fair. Um, and I would say, just as in a general population, there'll be some people out there who love Christians, think we're great. They, they're not Christians themselves, but they can value the church and what the church does to society. That's probably, I don't know, 70% of the population. And there might be 20% of the population who are going, mm, a bit suspect those Christians, I don't really understand them, they're all a bit weird. I've got more questions than I would have about a normal person. That's about 20%. And then maybe there's 10% who actually think, no, those Christians are really strange. I don't think they should be looking after children. And I think probably with a social work population, you'll get that same split. Now, there are laws in the UK to protect Christians and actually anybody. It's called equality legislation. And that's one of the things that Home for Good can help with, actually, that we're in touch, we're in close working relationships with local authorities for fostering and, and voluntary adoption agencies for adoption. So we can help people to kind of navigate that, but the system needs to be rigorous. Okay, just to, again, remind us, we're talking currently, <coughs> how many children need fostering stroke adoption? So we need 8,600 more families to start fostering, and we need uh, 4,000 children to get adopted. Okay, so, um, and you're saying, one way we can do this is, is through the fact that there are 15,000 plus churches. Mm. And if one family in one of these churches did this, the entire backlog could be cleared. We could meet the current need right now. We could do that. And that, that's huge. And, and actually when one family in the church begins to foster and adopt, the rest of the church have an amazingly powerful role to play. Um, I, I, we have an expression in our church, it takes a whole church to raise a child. And that's yes. particularly true when it comes to fostering. Yeah. So we've been delighted that there are lots of fostering aunties and uncles in our church. Yeah. Not, they're not no, biologically no, connected no. to us, but they've done wonderful things. So one little lad that we had, had ADHD off the scale. And so sitting for any amount of time in church was gonna be difficult. So with our permission, this guy would sit next to us and um, he'd say to my little lad, he'd say, what's it going to be this week? A bus, a train, a car? And uh, he was an engineer, so he was brilliant at drawing these kind of technical diagrams. And he managed to milk it out so it would last the entire service. But he had my little boy wrapped in attention. And, and it's those little pieces of sure. the church wrapping around, suddenly we feel better supported. I heard of a, a family um, who had lots of foster kids coming through their house and another, um, the house group they were part of decided they were going to wrap around this family. But on Monday night, someone from the house group was going to come, pick up all the ironing, take it away, bring it back the next day ironed. And they thought, that's brilliant, isn't it? That's keeping this family going by offering a very practical, but actually very sacrificial service. Yes. And, and when social workers hear about this, they can't believe it. Who, who are you people? Why do you love each other like that? You're, you're not even related. And then, well, actually we are related. Let me explain that yeah, to yeah, you. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's an incredible it witness an incredible. as well as a lovely support. Now, so anyone listening to our conversation, Chris, mm. they're kind of, uh, maybe they've already thought about it mm. or they've been provoked to think about it again and they want to explore. How do you explore becoming a foster parent? Well, the easiest way would be to phone us. If you're in the UK, you can phone us at Home for Good. But that's what we've got a kind of dedicated hotline. So you've got a whole system ready, all ready to go. All ready to go. And actually, I know this show doesn't just go out in the UK. Sure. In America, for example, there are 100,000 children waiting in the care system to be adopted. I don't mean they have to go around the world to adopt. You can no. adopt in your own state. In your own country. Do you know what? It's completely free. It doesn't cost you a penny if you adopt from foster care. So there's some huge potential there. Same in Australia, massive need for more foster carers in the system. Okay, uh, Chris, let's move to um, the refugee crisis. Um, currently, can you give us some facts, figures? 
tell us what, what is the situation regarding refugees? Mm. So this war in Syria has now been going on for about five years. Yes. And hundreds of thousands of civilians have been killed. Um, some because of the, the internal fighting between uh, President Assad um, and now groups like ISIS. And then we've got the kind of allies bombing as well. Absolute devastation. And so um, there's around four million people that have been displaced out of Syria into the surrounding countries of places like uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, and um, uh, yeah, Turkey, I suppose, would be the other one. Mm. Um, and of those four million, around two million are children. Now, most of those children are with family members, but actually, sadly, many, many aren't. And so there are a number of very vulnerable children. Save the Children um, reckons um, that in Europe, so tr people trying to get from those refugee camps, and I've visit th visited those camps, they're not camps, they're kind of like shanty towns, often really underprepared and underregulated. Um, many children have not been in school for three or four years, just desperate conditions. And so some people get to the point where they can't live like that anymore. And so dream of a better life and often come to Europe to do that. Now, Save the Children say that in transit, there are thousands, maybe tens of thousands of unaccompanied refugee children. Um, and those that don't have family with them are very vulnerable. Europol, which is the European version of Interpol, um, is very concerned that many of them have been abducted, uh, kidnapped or used in the trafficking industry. Yes. And so this is just awful, isn't it? They've, they've had to escape war, they've risked their lives to come across Europe, and then basically we've closed our doors to them, and so they are left destitute. And so we, we wanted to help. And there was, a, there was a week in the UK's public imagination where yes. things radically changed. At the beginning of the week, it was very clear that the UK was not going to receive any refugee children. And then there was a, a little boy, a three-year-old boy, Ilan Kurdi, and um, he was found washed up on a beach in Bodrum, Turkey. And yeah. there was a really yeah. awful picture of him face down in the water. And that, that one picture seemed to trigger something in our nation, and actually not just our nation, all around the world. That image changed the way that people saw this. And so on the Friday of that week, our Prime Minister, David Cameron, made an announcement that we in the UK were going to receive 20,000 refugees. And, you know, some are very critical, that's not enough. Germany was receiving 20,000 each weekend, and we were talking about 20,000 over five years. So there was a lot of criticism for that. I felt 20,000 is a lot better than zero, so let's encourage that, yes. that, that beginning point. And one thing that the government said, and particularly David Cameron, he said that we were going to focus our attention on vulnerable children, unaccompanied children. And he used a really strong phrase. He said, this is going to be the modern day equivalent of the kinder transport. Yeah. Now, you may remember that from your history lessons that at the beginning of the Second World War, mm. it became apparent that Jewish people were in incredible danger. And so the UK government and uh, one individual called Nicholas Winton organised a mass evacuation of Jewish children out of places like Czechoslovakia. And around 10,000 children came to the UK that way. It's an incredible story of hospitality from the nation. And our Prime Minister said, we're going to do the same again. Yes. And so we thought, OK, well, where are these children going to go? Because we don't want to put them in children's homes. That's not no, an appropriate place no. to care for a vulnerable child. They need families. But if they need families, well, they're going to have to be foster families. They can't just go anywhere. They're, they're vulnerable kids. Can't just place them somewhere unsafe. And so we said, well, hold on. We already need 8,600 foster families. Where are we going to get these new ones from? So we did something crazy. We, we launched a Facebook campaign. I say a campaign. I put up a web form and a picture. And uh, we said, look, guys, it's great that you want to send chocolates to Calais and blankets, but if you really want to sacrificially get involved, why don't you start the process to become a foster parent? We thought we'd get 150 people respond. Uh, we got 150 people respond in an hour. That was on a Friday night at nine o'clock. By Saturday morning, 1,200 people had signed up. Sunday morning, it was two and a half thousand. Currently, around 10,000 people have said they want to help through Home for Good yes. by becoming foster parents. So that's wonderful. We've been working with local authorities around the UK because there are already through one means or another, 3,000 refugee kids in the UK. Not all of them from Syria, some are from Afghanistan and Eritrea, but there are kids here that are in need of care. 
And not all of us could be foster parents for refugee children. Some of us could just be general foster carers and look after babies, and that would mean there's more space for other people to look after these refugee kids. But we're just seeing this national outpouring of, of sympathy, empathy and hospitality. And, and is the government aware of what you're doing? Yeah, we've been delighted to work very closely with the Home Office. We've been talking to the Minister for Syrian Refugees. They're aware of what we're doing. It's been brought up in uh, Prime Minister's question times and in the Houses of Parliament. So people know what we're doing. And it's been, for our tiny little charity, we've been across the table from the Red Cross or Save the Children or UNHCR. And we're just playing our part, advocating on behalf of these kids. For, for a, a couple who have their first baby, hmm. never prepared for it. No. Yeah. You know, you, you kind of learn as you go. Uh, I, I think by the time you get the hang of parenting, your children have left home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> when, when, when my son, Michael, he got married two years ago. And, um, and in fact, I, I do not use this word. This word is not in my vocabulary the word luck. Mm. It really isn't. I never use this word, but there wasn't another alternative word for it. Yeah. So on the day that he got married, I kind of tapped him on the shoulder. I said, really proud of you, Michael. Good luck with, to you with your kids. <laughs> 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 you know, I've done my best. <laughs> I, Mum and I have done our best. You know. Now, OK, it's hard enough with your own child mm. Taking a child f from a war zone, mm. traumatised, it's like, d we feel, maybe we feel totally inadequate to mm. know how we're going to do, be the father, be the mother mm. that we're meant to be. What would you say? I guess I'd go back to that situation in the Second World War. I, I, I met a guy, I was speaking at a, a men's breakfast. I don't know why it's only men that have breakfast, doesn't seem yeah. fair to me. But yeah. so he said to me, look, Chris, I really believe in what you're doing. Because I remember when I was seven years old, my parents took me to a train station in Czechoslovakia. And um, they said goodbye to me. I remember the last thing my mother doing was she was on the station platform and I was in the train. They had those kind of slidey windows. And she handed me her watch and she said, don't, don't forget us, please remember us. And it was only supposed to be for a short time that he was going to stay with a family in England. But that was the last time he saw his parents because they were killed in the gas chambers. And, you know, the UK, at an incredibly difficult time, there's a war going on, there's rationing, there's, there's air raids, and yet we still <coughs> said, we can do this. Now, like, they didn't have anything like the training or assessment that no. we get now as yeah. foster parents, but they said, this is the right thing to do. And so I guess I'm just saying to to the church, to the nation, we, we need to do it again. This is, this is another situation. That's what our Prime Minister said. He was right. This, there needs to be another kinder transport. And, you know, I find often with God that it's when I step out of my comfort zone, when I'm, you know, beyond my own resources, that suddenly I'm relying on God at a whole other level. And so, again, look, it's not for everybody. But I think more of us than maybe have already done ought to think about whether God is calling us to take this step. You've uh, written about it in this book, Home for Good. And is that really the story so far? Yeah, so a lot of that is our story. Um, my wife and I, we write together. All the good bits are, are due to her. But we've actually woven in lots of other people's stories. And a friend of mine who's a, a lecturer in theology at uh, St Andrews University, and I asked him to do it, a theological edit of it. And he was very gracious, and he did. And he said, I've been asked to theologically edit a lot of books, but this is the first one that had me crying into the computer as I was typing it. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's the grace of God, because there are so many stories of incredible men and women who have opened their lives up to the most vulnerable children. So it's a very powerful book, not just because of what we've written, but the stories we've been able to include. I like your subtitle here, Krish. Uh, making a difference for children in need. And, and really, that's, that's what it's about. And how did you come up with the title, Home for Good? Well, part of me says Gary Barlow had a little bit to do with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm secretly hoping one day 
Gary will sing me a version of um, Back for Good. Yes. But use Home for Good as the title. But seriously, all we're saying is that we want to use the place that we called home in the best way possible, whether that's through fostering or adoption. We want to use our homes as hospitals. So if people are, uh, want to know more, they can obviously read the book. Yeah. Gain a bit more um, insight. They can contact your website, which is homeforgood.org.uk, and there are there are hundreds of really useful resources on there. All sorts of videos. There's blog posts. There's stories, and there's actually some profiles of children that have been waiting a long time to be adopted, and some of them are heartbreaking. So there's a bit of a health warning. Be careful if you visit the site; you may end up adopting a child. <laughs> <laughs> And then in the midst of you uh, and your wife showing so much uh, compassion and empathy and doing what you can, and well, you're doing it personally and you're trying to get many other people to do it, uh, you also keep thinking. <laughs> and uh, this is your most recent book with a very unusual title called... Paradoxology. How did you come up with that? Oh, that was my wife. We were on a long distance car journey together and uh, we were just trying to find a way to help people wrestle with the most difficult parts of the Bible, the bits that don't seem to make sense. And our idea was actually sometimes um, God is most clearly present in the most difficult parts. We're trying to get rid of what I call fridge magnet Christianity. Yes. You know, the kind of Bible verses that everyone feels cosy about. I think we need to look at the tough parts to meet I suppose, the real powerful God who is a consuming fire. But the fridge magnets are nice though, aren't they? They are. <laughs> it's like, and when you've got a little picture and you're feeling a bit down and discouraged. <laughs> it's you need more than the fridge I magnets. I know, but Not my wife without and I, we're, we're trying to go through the Bible in one year. Yeah. Oh, and we're going through some of those Old Testament stories. <laughs> I, I, I actually said to my wife this morning, and I've, I've read the Bible many, many times. I said to Killy, it's doing my head in. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those stories, aren't they? They're and tough. It's They're like, tough. oh, can't we just read Psalm 103 or something? You know? <laughs> <laughs> he's a father, he's tender and sympathetic. <laughs> it's um, both and. We need, know. we need the good and, it's and the both, difficult. Yeah. So in the process of doing this, uh, do you feel you, as you've engaged with some of these mm. paradox issues, do you feel you've arrived at more clarity? Yeah, in, in one sense, the book was a bit of theological therapy. There, there was stuff I couldn't really get my head around. And I find writing about that is a great way for me to be able to learn. And so I thought maybe other people would find that helpful too. What's the most difficult passage that you've come across? Ooh. I really struggle with the first paradox, which was uh, the Abraham paradox. Why would a God who owns everything ask us to give up so much? Why does he ask Abraham to sacrifice Isaac? That, that, I find that so hard to get my head around. So that was a very difficult one. I think also the Job paradox is tough, isn't it? Yeah. Why is God so actively passive in that story? What, what was he doing? Seems really unfair. So I don't promise nice, neat answers, but I do promise that your brain will be stretched in new ways. And hopefully your heart mm. will have a greater sense of um, honour and, and passion for God as a result. What would you say, uh, Krish, to, you know, a, a couple, they've been happily married, they've, they, they've both got very good jobs, they love each other, want a family, can't conceive. Hmm. And uh, a 15 year old girl goes to a party and gets pregnant. Hmm. Why would, the, why would God let a 15-year-old get pregnant it's and so not tough. let a couple mm. who love God are great and just want a child and they can't conceive? What would you say to that couple? It, it, it is so tough to understand what God is doing. Uh, I, I sometimes think about it a bit like a... Um, imagine you're at, a, at one of those IMAX cinemas, those huge ones, a massive screen. And uh, maybe you can see a caterpillar climbing up the screen. And to the caterpillar, it can't make any sense of what's going on on that screen at all. It's just like lights and everything. 
And it's only with perspective, isn't it, that you're far enough away from the screen that you can see what's going on. And I wonder, this side of eternity, I can't make sense of all the bits that God is doing in the world. It doesn't, doesn't make sense. I can't, <laughs> can't compute it all. But from the perspective of eternity, I trust that there is a loving God who isn't messing around with us, isn't playing around with us because otherwise he wouldn't have sent Jesus to die on a cross for our sins. He, he's committed, he loves us. But I think it's only with the perspective of eternity that I'll be able to understand how those bits fit together. But otherwise, you know, I'm just that little caterpillar climbing up a screen trying to make sense of it all. Yeah, but in many ways, yeah, Christians are an Easter people living mm. in a Good Friday world. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. But it feels like Easter Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're living, aren't we, with, with the tension of knowing mm. uh, that he is the risen, crucified, resurrected Jesus. That's right. But we're living in this Good Friday broken world and we're struggling with the two. Mm. And, um, but amidst everything that you've seen, and obviously you have seen quite a bit of suffering, you're m much more aware of the needs of children um, and uh, much more aware with what's happening with refugees. Um, what, what keeps you motivated as a Christian to trust God mm. that he's ultimately in control? Why doesn't, you know, because you, you, you referred earlier on that people are abducting these refugee children, mm. you know, why doesn't God just kill the abductors. Mm, mm. He would have done that Old Testament time, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Why doesn't he do it now? Well, he did it a couple of times in the New Testament too, didn't he? Um, I, I guess, I, as you say, that, that, that Easter story is the right one to cling to. I, I can't make sense of it all, but I know for certain that God is just. Otherwise, the cross would have been unnecessary, wouldn't it? God wouldn't have sent Jesus to pay for the sins of the world if God didn't care about justice, if he could have just brushed injustice under the carpet. But I know from the cross that God is loving because, again, he wouldn't, wouldn't have sent Jesus if he didn't care about us and want us in a relationship with him. And so we often talk about clinging to the cross, and I think I end up doing that when I, when I face suffering or hear some of the terrible stories that the kids that we look after have come from. I cling to the cross. I don't understand what you're doing, God but I know you love and I know you're just and I will hang on. As you look to the future, um, I, and I, if I said to you, you know, what are your dreams and aspirations? Obviously, to get all these children yeah. <laughs> adopted and fostered. Anything else? Well, I do think that, that engagement would change things. So if, if, if it happened, if Christians began to foster and adopt more than we're doing already, you engage with poverty at a whole nother level. For some people, justice is, is a badge, you know, or a T-shirt or a conference. For others, it's, you know, it's a contribution once a month. For, for others, it's a, a place on a rotor, isn't it? I'm, I do my justice work Thursday evenings once a month. But once you start welcoming vulnerable kids into your life, you're having breakfast, you're, you're hearing their stories, suddenly their needs become your needs. So I, I didn't used to care about the immigration issue. I was born here, I've got a British passport. But when one of my foster kids doesn't have the right to remain in the country, I'm down there outside the Nigerian embassy at six o'clock in the morning because I care, it's my boy. And, and that connectivity with the issues of poverty and justice, I'd love to see the church take the next step. And I think fostering and adoption could be part of that journey. Chris, you're seriously, you and your wife, uh, uh, truly are, are an inspiration and um, I, I pray that you you will see in the not too distant future these thousands of children uh, both in our country and thousands of refugees um, find as your book title and your charity is called Home for Good. Krish Kandia, thank you. Thank you, Jenny.